Well, this is the first time I've been here, and uh, what a place, what a miracle, what God's done for you here. I am thrilled to see it. And uh, then I was looking in your, your brand new hymn books. I assume these are the brand new ones, right? I opened it up, and I realized, first of all, Living Hymns. Oh, I said, oh, hey, I think I know the guy that uh, publishes that. So I opened it up, <clears throat> looked inside. I just returned Monday night from Israel on a tour of Israel. For my first time I've ever been there, uh, a seven-day trip uh, that was designed for pastors only. And somehow they got me in under the wire. <laughs> and uh, so I got to go, and one of the pastors on the trip is listed in, in your hymn book under the second edition editorial team, Dr. David B. Smith. That's not really an accurate, that's not really accurate. It should be Dr. Dr. David B. Smith. This guy is unbelievably educated. He's got a couple of master's degrees and a couple of doctor's degrees, one in theology and one in uh, uh, music conducting from the University of North Carolina. He is the son of Al Smith, the famous Al Smith who published all the Singspiration series. Many of you probably have some of those old books. And uh, so I was just on a tour with him, and he's as big as his dad. I mean, <laughs> gigantic guys. You know, the, you, know, you know of Al Smith, I'm sure. And uh, so I was amazed to see this. And then I noticed this, first edition assisting editors, Donna and Conrad Krieger. They were a singing duet team a husband and wife um, team from Denver, Colorado that uh, traveled with uh, the past the preacher who was my mentor many years ago uh, in uh, the western states. Do Conrad and Donna used to travel with them and so my wife and I really sort of got our inspiration to start trying to sing duets and all that from Conrad and Donna Krieger. We'll never be the musicians they are but we could be the, we, we could try, you know. Hey, it's good to see you here tonight. <clears throat> and uh, I, know the, I know the pastor has gone away and his wife has gone away and I guess they took a few with them and they keep bragging about the temperatures there where they are. <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> Not so as you can notice, huh? <laughs> but anyway... Uh, Hey, I'm so glad that you're here tonight in church. I suppose that I probably can't get by without a ditty or two. It's already been mentioned to me tonight about ditties. Nobody ever remembers my preaching. <laughs> Nobody ever remembers my singing. But everybody remembers my ditties. <laughs> so I guess I just have to keep singing ditties. And since this is, uh, we're, we're now approaching uh, Valentine's Day, I guess I thought, what else? I, you know, I mean, I feel like God gave me a special message for tonight. Yeah, I've never preached it before. I just got back from Israel, and I got to thinking about some of the things that I saw there. I'm not going to give you a, a tour of Israel. I've been through too many of those, and I fell asleep under every one of them. And so <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But, uh, but, and I don't have any slides to show. <laughs> Maybe I should. But uh, I, I do have a few ditties that have to do with Valentine's Day. So after the ditties, I'll, I'll change gears and we'll go a completely different direction, okay? Is that all right? In other words, I'm telling you that ditties don't have anything to do with the sermon. <laughs> This is an old Irish ditty that my granddad and my daddy used to sing. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard it before. If this, uh, if, if this is the first time I had ever met you, I probably would not attempt this. <laughs> Especially not as my introductory ditty. But I decided I would take a chance on it tonight by doing this. Johnny McCarthy loved Rosie O'Day. She was the prettiest thing. And every night in his sweet Irish way, under her window he'd sing, Rose O'Day, Rose O'Day, 
You're my Philagadusha, Shinamarusha, Balder Alderboom, 2DA. Sorry, I don't have an interpreter. You're daring, you're darling. I love you, Rose O'Day, Rose O'Day. You're my Philagadusha, Shinamarusha, Balder Alderboom, 2D, Boom, 2D, Boom, 2D, Boom, 2D, A. You heard it first at Cross Point Baptist Church. <laughs> well, I figured, who knows? I might never get invited back anyhow, so why not? <laughs> this is a ditty that I learned from my college roommate, my freshman year in college. He, uh, he and I sort of uh, became a, a, ditty, a ditty duo and uh, ended up doing the entertainment for some of the class parties and some of that kind of malarkey. We'd do some skits and things like that and pretend, you know, talk, talk about, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, hi, my name is Homer, and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, my brother, um, uh, Iliad. And <laughs> we'd, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we, we would... We would, we would do a, a few silly things like that, and then we would launch into a few ditties like The Midnight Drag of Hank Revere, and he could do uh, um, The Cremation of Sam McGee. How many of you have ever heard that one? You've never heard of The Cremation of Sam McGee? That's an Alaska poem. And uh, my, uh, my, uh, my roommate used to do it. I wish I could do it for you. I, I, I never tried to memorize it because he could do it so well. It starts out, there's, a, there's strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. <laughs> but something about the strangest thing I ever heard and the strangest that ever was told was the night on the marge of Lake LeBarge, Le I cremated Sam McGee. <laughs> You'll have to look it up. <laughs> Anyhow, I can't do that one, but this one I did also learn from him uh, by just hearing him say it over and over again. It goes like this. By the way, I did not write this. You have to know I did not write this. I, I have to make sure that you understand. If you understand I did not write this little ditty, please hold up your hand. I won't say it unless everybody holds up their hand. All in favor say aye. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> The girl of my dreams. I did not write this poem, okay? <laughs> it's very important to the long-term survival of my marriage that you yeah. know I did not write this poem. The girl of my dreams is the ugliest of all the girls at school. A homely thang with no brains at all. She earns much ridicule. Now some of the guys make fun of my gal, but my love, they'll never spoil. For deep inside, in my heart, I know her dad owns Standard Oil. <laughs> and some of you have been around long enough to remember a guy who was somehow associated with Moody Bible Institute many years ago. His name was Don Loney. Anybody ever heard of Don Loney? Wow, I've lived long enough to outlive the reputation of Don Loney. <laughs> Don Loney was another guy who did ditties and uh, did high school assemblies and things like that. And he had this uh, cute little one, little ditty about, I ran my fingers through her hair. What could I do but linger? And while I paused a moment there, a cootie bit my finger. <laughs> I only get to do these once a year at Valentine's Day, you know. <laughs> How about Bill? He had a gal named Sal, and she was from the South. Her ma, she curled her hair so tight she couldn't shut her mouth. <laughs> oh, brother. Or this one. <clears throat> black, black, black is the color of my love's true hair. Although her tresses are as red as a rose, black is the color of my love's true hair. <laughs> That'll take you a while. <clears throat> oh, well, anyway. 
I am thrilled to be here with you, and I want to say thank you from my wife and, and uh, myself for your support of our work and our ministry, and the Lord has been good to us. Uh, this trip to Israel was completely a surprise to, to me. Uh, many years ago, I had kind of decided that I probably would never go, even though I would, thought I would like to go, but I just kind of decided, well, that's not going to ever happen, so I kind of put it out of my mind. <clears throat> but my daughter, our daughter, uh, who was here uh, in the area with us uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Dana, who lives in Ontario, uh, decided that after her trip to Israel that daddy's got to go. <laughs> so she wrote a letter, sent it to a lot of friends of mine, and uh, lo and behold, some folks contributed money, and uh, I don't even know who all of them were, honestly, because uh, it, so far they've all been anonymous, but uh, I'm still working on trying to find out so I can thank people properly for the trip. And I got to go uh, for seven days and uh, got to see many of the sites and couple of really unusual things that, I, that we were able to see. Uh, there is a new multimedia presentation uh, um, site that is being developed. It won't open actually for business until April 15th. It's called Friends of Zion. And uh, it, I guess you can go online and, and look up uh, Friends of Zion uh, and, and you'll find, it, find some information there about it. It, it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, presentation that honors Christian people who have helped with the return to Israel of so many Jews since 1947-1948. Uh, among those that they honored were people like Corey Ten Boom. Many of you are f familiar with her story, and. Uh, and then there were others like uh, uh, President Harry Truman. Uh, there's a whole batch, whole list of them. The one that surprised me the most was Horatio Spafford. How many of you know who Horatio Spafford is? Yeah, some of you know. He wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul, after his four daughters drowned at sea. But I did not know that the latter years of Horatio Spafford's life, he and his wife devoted uh, to, the, to helping w bring Jews back to Israel, and they actually lived in Israel, and I think died in Israel. Didn't know that until I went through that presentation. So it was a very interesting thing. Then our uh, guide was a, a Jewish man uh, who's been guiding tours for over 30 years, very knowledgeable man. And uh, he, a, a dear friend of his is a, an archaeologist who has done many uh, archaeological digs in Jerusalem. And uh, he does not often open up any of those to, uh, they, I mean, they usually wait until everything is done before they ever open it up to a tour group. But because this was a group of pastors, they took us uh, down into this archaeological dig and showed us Hezekiah's tunnel and uh, various other things down in this dig, which were just, uh, it was just a tremendous thing to, to have the opportunity to see. And uh, so, anyway, uh, thank you folks for your prayers and, uh, and for your faithfulness to, to stand with us. We try to be sure to pray for you on a regular basis here. And uh, I, I visit quite frequently with your pastor uh, he's, um, he has greatly honored me and, and uh, I had the privilege to be the pastor of their family many years ago and uh, almost feel like the roles are reversed now. And uh, so anyway, would you take your Bible tonight and turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Everywhere that I went in Israel, <clears throat> there were both Jews and Palestinians trying to sell widows' mites. 
Many of these were just loose coins of, uh, you know, just a really worn out looking coins and uh, who knows whether they're authentic or whether they're, they're, they're really the, from back in that era or if there's something that, is, that somebody's producing, I don't know. They look old. I didn't buy any of them. Some are handsomely displayed in polished olive wood exhibits and they can be purchased for like $30 or something like that, you know. And these guys will never let up trying to, trying to get you to buy their wares. Uh, I didn't, I really didn't buy, I didn't buy any curios uh, while I was over there. But um, I want you to look with me at this passage about the story, Mark chapter 12 and beginning in verse 35, Mark 12, 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Jesus, like the law of Moses, had great concern for widows. But while Jesus again and again expressed great concern for widow ladies, there were arrogant merchandisers who to this day still profit from the plight of desperate women who happen to be widows. Perhaps it is difficult for us to really understand how desperate the situation is for these dear ladies in countries where there is virtually no welfare program, in countries where they, they are just cast upon whatever means they can, they can find to, to make do and to get by. But I want you to notice what Jesus said about these people who make merchandise of the widows. And I could not help but think of this as these people would approach me on the street trying to sell me these widow's mites because in a sense, though they do not know the widows and of no, though they do not know that widow that Jesus told about, they are still to this day merchandising and making, making a profit off of the story that Jesus told or that the Bible tells us about Jesus and this widow that threw in the two mites. Notice that in verse 42, Jesus promised, these shall receive greater damnation. I, was, I took the time to take a look at, in, for the last couple of years, I've been doing something that I wish someone had told me to do a long time ago. I asked my wife to get me a copy of the Henry Morris Study Bible. 
And I just told her I, I would like to just have a hardback copy, not a leather-bound one, not a real good, well-bound one, just a, a hardback copy, because I was just going to use it for my devotions and that kind of thing. And, and I took the Henry Morris Study Bible, which uh, actually it's originally called the Defender's Study Bible. He wouldn't allow his name to be on it. But, of course, now that he's gone to heaven, they, they, his sons have put his name on it, and it's now called the Henry Morris Study Bible. I began, I, I began in, in the New Testament and I began reading every footnote and looking up every cross-reference. Isn't it amazing how we buy all kinds of books and never really take time to use the study Bible that we have? Have you, have you looked up every footnote and every reference and read it in your Bible? How many of you have ever done that? Yeah, hey, there's... There. <laughs> One, how about that, out of a crowd like this? I'd never really thought about doing it. And now, lately, I've, since I started doing that, it's been such a blessing to me that uh, I, I've, had, uh, I've had young Christians ask me, uh, how should they get started? And, I, and that's what I tell them to do. Get a good study Bible. It doesn't have to be the Henry Moore study Bible. Get a good study Bible and start reading those footnotes and looking up every cross-reference. And you'll be amazed at how, what a broad uh, coverage it will give you of various teachings in the Bible. Well, Henry Morris notes in his footnotes that this incident with the widow and her mites was the last act of Jesus' public ministry. The last public act that Jesus did in the ministry. In the next chapter, he warned his disciples to watch. We'll look at that a little bit. In Mark 14, he was anointed with expensive ointment. But again, that was, that was not his ministry. That was something that was done to him. Uh, in Mark 14, he observed the Last Supper of the Passover with his disciples. But that was not so much a public ministry as it was a private ministry with his own disciples. He, he, he also prayed in the garden. He was betrayed by Judas. He was arrested. He was tried in Jewish and Roman, Roman courts. He was abused. He was scourged. He was crowned with thorns, mocked, and he was crucified. But in a way, this was the last public ministry of Jesus. Isn't it interesting that the last thing that Jesus chose to do and to emphasize and to point out before he went into the what we call the passion, the week of passion, was this simple little story about this woman. I'd like you to consider what is the message of, of Jesus standing there observing as people were dropping their offering into the offering box in the temple. What is the message? Well, I think that, first of all, maybe we should talk about what it is not. And I think the best way we could begin is to go on from the end of the passage we read into the next chapter in chapter 13. Look with me there. Chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, And as he went out of the temple, he's just finished saying though, what he said about the, the, the widow, and he went out of the temple. One of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Hmm. And so the first thing I'd like to say about this story about the widow's mites, what is the message? Well, it's not about the economy. It's not about the economy. It's not about buildings and stones and property and stuff. Are you with me? It's not about that. In other words, when Jesus was talking about this lady putting in her two mites, he was not talking about the economy. Remember Bill Clinton and his, and his campaign for president and his little, mo his little mantra was, it's about the economy, stupid. Remember that? 
Well, I've got news for you. What Jesus was teaching us here was not about the economy. It was not about the economy. I remember that I took a few classes at the University of Nebraska in Omaha many years ago in American history and in American literature. My American history professor stood before a class of probably a hundred students. It was a low, uh, lower uh, level, maybe freshman or sophomore course, and there were a great crowd of students. He was an excellent lecturer. But all the way through his lectures, he always kept coming back to this statement that it's always about the money. It's always about the money. And whatever he was talking about in early American history, he always kept coming back to it. It's always about the money. As I sat and thought about this today, I, I googled on the internet to find out because I thought I remembered some things. I just put in Karl Marx on the economy. You all know who Karl Marx is, who wrote the Communist Manif Manifesto. And all you have to do is put in Karl Marx on economy. And it, and you'll have plenty to read there. For Karl Marx, the basic determining factor of history is always economics. By the way, isn't that the message we get almost every day on network news? And I'm not, I don't care which network you want to talk about. They're always talking about the economy, the economy, the economy, the economy. Well, I got news for you tonight. What Jesus was saying about the, the widow's mites was not about the economy. He, just because he was talking about money, he was not talking about economy. How can we admire Jesus but reject his absolute life of faith? What I'm saying to you tonight is this, that Christian people, dear Christian people in America, we have, we have been lied to and we have, we have been brainwashed into this idea that everything is about the economy and everything's about the money. I don't care if it's the Democrats or the Republicans or the Independents, they're all going to talk to you about the economy, 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 economy. It's all about the economy. No, it is not about the economy. And dear Christian friend, as long as you keep thinking that your Christian life is all about the economy, you're headed down a dead-end street. Because the life of faith, the kind of life that Jesus lived, was not built on considerations of the economy. Jesus lived purely by faith. And that's what He called us to do. Not just the preachers. Not just the missionaries. He called all of us to a life of faith. So what's the message about this offering that Jesus observed where the lady dropped in two mites? It's not about the economy. A wealthy man moved in next door to a Quaker you know, the Quakers were known for their simplicity and for their plainness and uh, getting by with as little as possible. And this man, this, this man watched, <coughs> the Quaker watched the wealthy man unload his furniture and his clothes and appliances and collectibles and all that. And after he had watched them, he finally approached and said these words, Neighbor, if thee hath need of anything, please come to see me, and I will tell thee how thou might get along without it. <laughs> but what is the message of the widow's offering? Well, secondly, consider with me what it tells us in chapter 12 and verse 41. We already read it, but let's look at it again. My second thought is this, it's not about prosperity. In verse 41 it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how 
the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. The key word, I think, is that word, how. Jesus beheld how they cast in their, in their offerings. You know, Jesus observes how we cast our offerings in, too. Why did, the rich man, why did the rich cast in much? Well, Jesus explains it in verse 44. It says, For they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all she had, even all her living. So, Jesus points out that the rich cast in much because of their abundance. Because of their prosperity. But the message that Jesus is teaching us here is not about prosperity. Uh, maybe I should just try to change it up a bit and say it this way. The problem here is these folks were just tipping God. They're just tipping Him. Kind of like you tip, a, tip somebody at the hotel or for carrying your bags in, or like you tip, tip uh, 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 someone in the restaurant, just tipping. And the truth is that there are many, there are many Christians even, who only tip God. And the reason that they do it that way is because their mindset is, this is mine. Everything in my checkbook is mine. Everything in my bank account is mine. Everything in my wallet is mine. No, it's not. It's not yours at all. <laughs> in fact, you don't own anything. You're only a manage, manager. You're only a steward. You, you have the privilege of handling the goods of the wealthiest landowner in the universe. It all belongs to the Lord. And he's given you a portion of it. Covetousness is the engine of politics, education, religion, business, commerce, travel, hospitality, and much more. And unfortunately, covetousness is where most Christians live. I can't tell you how many times as a, a traveling evangelist, I've had people come and approach me and say, uh, maybe they'd invite me to their home and then they, we would sit down and at the coffee table and they'd take out a piece of paper and they'd start drawing circles on, the, on a piece of paper. <laughs> it happened so many times that I, I got so I could recognize the circles. <laughs> I knew what was coming. Another pitch for me to sign up for Amway. Don't misunderstand. I don't, I'm not saying that it's wrong to be in Amway or, for that matter, any of the multi-level things. I, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong. Uh, I never got involved in, in those, but, um, I mean, I never got involved in Amway, but, but I, I can't tell you how many times I've had people... Uh, approach me with it and, and invariably the approach was uh, what would you like to do if, if you had uh, if you had all the money available to you what would you do and uh, I remember the first time I heard that pitch I didn't know where this guy was going with the thing and I said I was an evangelist I said well I'd like to have a motorhome to live in you know <laughs> we're living in our car you know <laughs> I'd like to have a motorhome boy he capitalized on that motorhome thing and that was his whole pitch, why I needed to get in Amway. And because I was an evangelist, I meet a lot of people. And everywhere I could go, I could be signing up people for Amway. Years later, by the way, I read a book. I don't know if you ever saw this book. There was a book written by a guy, what was his name? Phil Kearns, I think, wrote a book called Fake It Till You Make It. <laughs> and he, I don't know whether he knew what he was talking about or not, but he said... The people who make it big in Amway don't make it on the products. They make it on the motivational tapes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 
If you're with Emily, you can come and beat me up afterwards. But, <laughs> but all I'm saying is this. I'm not, look, I'm not saying it's wrong to be in Amway, and I'm not saying it's wrong to sell cars, and I'm not saying it's wrong to be in business, okay? I believe that all of those things are legitimate, and I think that we all ought to be somehow involved in some means of bringing in what is needful to provide for our family. The Bible says if you won't work, you shouldn't eat. So I'm not talking against providing for your own. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there's a fine line between, between a legitimate uh, interest in providing for my own and being overcome with covetousness and unholy desire to obtain that which I cannot righteously obtain. That's really what went wrong with Lot. He looked out on the valley. He had the opportunity. His uncle said, choose whatever land you want. He decided he wanted the best land. He ripped off his own uncle who had provided everything for him. All because of covetousness in his heart. Well, Luke 12, 15, Jesus said this, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. As I was walking around in Israel and, and people were hawking their wares. I mean, listen, we, we, I guess we had nine pastors on this trip who were from, uh, uh, who were from West Virginia. And, and we heard more about West Virginia all week long. You know, these guys were bragging about West Virginia. They all wore their West Virginia uh, ball caps and they had West Virginia shirts and polo shirts and everything had these WV uh, uh, logos on them. Well, We'd walk through the markets in, in Israel and they're selling West Virginia t-shirts and ball caps. Yeah. And some of these guys were buying them. One guy bought 10 caps. He bartered with this guy until he got him to sell him ten ball caps for two for for uh, or t ten ten ball caps for twenty bucks. I think it was two bucks a piece or something like that. <laughs> I, as I walked around and watched all of that going on, I kept thinking about Cicero. You know, C Cicero went to the carnival, and they said that when Cicero went to the carnival, his comment was, "Only now do I see." Uh, how many things I do not need. <laughs> Only now do I see how many things I do not need. Listen, if things are the measure of a man, Jesus is out of the running. Jesus didn't have a whole lot of things. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, he said. When you're engrossed in the things that money buys, there's an awful tendency to forget the things that money cannot buy. Now, I know this is the Wednesday night crowd, and folks, I want to ask you tonight, I, I, look, as I prayed over what God would have me to bring to you, I wanted to... I, I just felt like I ought to talk to you about this widow's mite thing. And, and then as I look on you tonight and I, I'm thinking, man, there's snow out there and it's cold. and These are the folks that did come to church. Why, why am I beating them up? about? These are the folks that did put the money in the offering, right? And maybe the real reason is because you are the folks who need to get a burden to pray for the entire congregation of Cross Point Baptist Church. That folks will come to lay aside the covetous lifestyle and this thinking that everything is about the economy and come back to live by faith and trust God. Let me come to the third thought I have for you. 
In Mark 12, 41, I see this. It's about intentionality. It's not about the economy. It's not about prosperity. But it is about intentionality. And the key word is the word motive. Uh, in Mark 12 and verse 41, it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast their money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. Motive is something that causes a person to act in a certain way. We do the things we do. We, th we, we conduct our lives in the ways that we do because of something that is unseen that is down inside of us called motives. If you have a Sunday school class, I can tell you that somewhere down inside of you, you have certain motives, certain motivations that make you decide to be a Sunday school teacher. We all have certain motives for why we do the things we do. And Jesus here was talking about the intentionality of motives. There, in other words, this dear woman walked in and he, he watched her as she dropped two mites in and Jesus knew that was it. That's all she had. That was her entire living. And she just dropped it in the offering. Now he had watched as wealthy people came by and were tipping God and putting in different amounts. And then comes this woman and drops in the tiniest little coins. I mean, these things are smaller than a penny, a widow's mite. And, and she drops in these two coins, but Jesus saw her heart motive. He saw what was underneath all of that. You know, in art and literature and music, the idea of motive translates into something that we call a motif. Some of you are familiar with a motif. Uh, for example, in art or in art, for example, it might be a recurrent shape. Like maybe it's a cross, maybe it's a, maybe it's some certain design. I mean, even, even in wallpaper, wallpaper has a motif. Okay. In music. In music, there is a motif. If you, if you, uh, if you listen to uh, good music, good music will have recurring themes throughout the musical piece. That, that, that recurring theme, it may not even be the main part of the song. It's, it's kind of underneath everything. And, and, if, and you may not even notice it unless you are trained to notice those kinds of things. But this motif is, is, is like a, it, it, it's something that, that carries, uh, carries the music along. Uh, it can be a theme, a pattern, a design, a musical movement. Uh, I, looked at, I looked up this word motif in dictionary.com and it said, a dominant idea or feature such as, listen to this, the prophet motif of free enterprise. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> We're back on the same topic, aren't we? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> We're right back there. In other words, all this talk about the economy is really talking about profit, profit, profit. You've got to make a profit. got to got to get more than you had before. Some folks know the prices of everything, but the value of nothing. Dear Christian, I ask you to take a good look at your life. Do you know what is really valuable? What is it that's really worth dying for? I thank God for giving you this building and this property. I thank God for what He's doing and how uh, so many miraculous things have taken place here at Cross Point. But we must never forget that 
there are certain things that do not have to do with buildings and properties that are the true values. Tonight, as they talked about the announcements, they talked about going soul winning, reaching people with the gospel. That is one of those core values that a lot of churches have forgotten about. Don't let it happen here. And the only way you cannot let it happen here is to guard your own motives to make sure that your, 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 your motives are, have to do with walking with God, knowing Christ better, letting Him rule in your life. Let me come to number four. It's about inventory. <laughs> What is the message of, of the widow's mites? I think it's about inventory. And why do I say that? Because it's about reserves. See, Jesus pointed out in verse 44, they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Listen, when the lady passed the box and dropped in those two coins, she walked away with nothing. She had no reserves. She couldn't go home and open a little box somewhere and take out a few more widow's mites. There weren't any more. She gave all that she had. See, it's about inventory. And, the, and what Jesus was telling us was, if we live by faith, then we can give all that we have. Now, I know, listen, I know about, I know all about those churches. I, believe me, I know about the churches where, where, where people are abused and, and they're, they're challenged to give, uh, you know, give it all Sunday and things like that. Not necessarily saying that that's wrong to do that. It, it's all, it's, it, the, the question is all about the motives, okay? Right. See? I don't say, I'm not saying that it would be wrong for you to have your own give it all Sunday and not tell anybody. In fact, wouldn't that be something? If God would lay it on your heart to say, you know what, I'm going to do it like the widow did. I'm not going to tell the pastor. I'm not going to tell anybody in church. But I'm just going to take a step of faith and see what God will do. I'm going to cast in all my living and see how God will work it out for me. There are Christians who have done that. There are Christians who live like that frequently in their, their life of faith. See, as long as we've got an inventory laid back, <laughs> we'll never know, will we? We'll never really find out. We'll never be able to find out how that woman felt after she dropped that money in there and walked away. As she walked past Jesus... I don't know whether she even knew that she was walking past the Creator, <laughs> that she was walking past God, who had stood there and saw exactly what she did and turned to His disciples and explained to them what she did. But listen, when our motives are right, you can be very sure that God is watching and He does know. He knows. So tonight, what is the message? Well, the point is, what did she have left? Well, all she had left was her faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, you're familiar with it, says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Living by faith is tr absolutely trusting God. So we live by faith when it's time for faith promise. We live by faith when a, there's a special building fund campaign. We live by faith when a family member has cancer. We live by faith when the prodigal is off in the far country and we don't know if they're ever going to come back. We live by faith in those kinds of situations. But Jesus took notice of the widow's might because she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. 
In other words, the Lord measures our gifts by what is left over. I'm just convinced that for a lot of my life, and probably for many of our lives, we've been investing in the wrong life. We've been investing in homes and cars and clothes and stocks and bonds and who knows what else. And when do we get around to investing in eternity? Now listen, I know, I know that, you, that many of you have given and given and given here at Cross Point and you have, you have taken some major steps of faith but I hope that you won't, you won't walk away and say, well, I did it once and that's the end of that. We, my wife and I used to sing this song. Maybe you've heard the song. This is just one verse of the song. To invest your seed of trust in God In mountains you can't move you have risked your life on things you cannot prove. But when you give up what you cannot keep for what you cannot lose, that's the way to find the joy God has for you. There is a joy unspeakable and full of glory that will fill your soul when you have given up what you cannot keep to gain something eternal that you cannot lose. One day, I, my wife and I were, this is years ago in Denver, Colorado, we, we drove past a church that we had been members of. Your pastor was a member, in fact, a staff member at this church at one time, a great church called South Sheridan Baptist Church in Denver, Colorado a church that at that time was probably running 2,500 to 3,000 in attendance, a great ministry, had a big Christian school and, and bus ministry and a lot of things going on there. And my wife and I had been members there and then we had gone away to be a, a church staff member at another church and we drove by to, to visit some of our friends from that church and just to drop by for a short visit for maybe 10 minutes on our way to somewhere else and and they lived in a neighborhood where there were several families from the church lived in this particular neighborhood. And we were pulling a travel trailer at that time and uh, headed for a revival meeting or something. And, and so we, we just parked along the side of the road and it, I mean, it was kind of not exactly like you could go incognito with this big old trailer behind you. So some of the people looked out and wondered who it was and, and uh, Little by little, the word went around the community, and since we had been members of that church, several of the men and, and even some of the ladies came and talked to my wife, but several of the men came and gathered there and talked to me for several minutes outside this, this uh, van. They began telling me about how that they had launched a building fund program at that church and how in the past, when they had built buildings, they had always borrowed money and... and uh, gone into debt, but now they had gone to the Lord in prayer many times and they had launched forth to try to see what God might provide for them in building a new building for their school that was going to be built debt-free. They said, we're going to build until as long as we have money, when we run out, we'll stop. The pro we'll, if we have to, we'll stop the the construction. They never did have to stop. They, they were able to go ahead and finish the entire building. But I, I tell you this story tonight to, to tell you about a man named Dan Seek. Dan Seek and I had been in the same Sunday school class. I'll never forget how that he told how he got saved. And <laughs> he said that the night he got saved, he, he, uh, the, the assistant pastor of the church had, had led him to Christ. And, and he said that. Uh, he had a big bar with, with all kinds of booze in his basement. And after he got saved, he took the preacher down to the bar and he said, what am I going to do with all of this <laughs> now that I'm a Christian? And the pastor looked at him and said, well, I think you ought to just pour it down the drain. 
And he said, that's exactly what we did. He said, for the rest of the night, evening, we were popping the tops. He said, we had the cleanest, we had the cleanest uh, uh, plumbing in, in town, <laughs> in Denver. He said, we poured it all down the tube. And, and, and that was just one incident out of Dan Seek's testimony, how God worked in his life and he had grown so much. Dan Seek stood outside that van and looked at me and said, Brother Spear, you know, God's going ma to make several men become millionaires through this building program. I said, Dan, what do you mean? He said, you know, some of our men have taken steps of faith and have promised to give amounts of money that they do not have any access to. They don't have any idea where it's coming from, but they have promised God that they will give it as God provides. And about two years later, I talked to him again. And I said, remember that day when you told me that God was going to make several millionaires? He grinned, and he started naming the names of about five men in that church who literally had not been millionaires, but as they gave, God began to provide in unusual ways for them. And they literally did become millionaires. <laughs> I don't think that's an ordinary story. And I'm not saying that that's a template that God's going to use in every life. But what I am saying is this. You know, this widow's mite story is really about inventory. What's left? And when we give knowing that there is nothing left, where do we have, where, where can we look but to look to the Lord? <laughs> and listen, if you're not prepared to look to the Lord, then definitely don't, don't throw in those last two mites. Don't do it. Don't you dare do it if, if your motive is not right. You've got to make sure that your heart is right with God. Let me give you the fifth thought. It's about perceptivity. I don't even know if that's a word, <laughs> but I liked it. In other words, I'm saying it's about watchfulness. Look with me at the last part of chapter 13. We're going to skip the whole chapter, even though it's all obviously all connected. And look with me at chapter 13 and verse 33. Take ye heed, Jesus said, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of, his, of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Do you realize that when Jesus said that in that last verse, he was not just talking to the disciples. He says, what I say unto you, I say unto all. In other words, he was saying that to every one of us here tonight. We don't know when he's coming back. But we do know that He has promised that He is coming back. And because He is coming back, we need to be watchful. Several times in the passage He says, watch, watch, watch. He told them He was leaving. They should be watchful. He gave them authority and He gave them assignments. And repeatedly He told them to watch. God has given this church a wonderful opportunity, authority in this community and he has given you a, an assignment a, a major assignment that cannot be accomplished by one person an assignment that can only be accomplished by this local body of believers God has given you this assignment and the authority to carry it out you've already seen miracles don't relax now don't fall asleep be careful that you don't listen to that tune. rock a baby in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, 
You know what? When we fall asleep on the job, we're courting disaster in the Lord's work. I know. Listen, I, I haven't been here. And even your pastor, though he's, he, he talks to me frequently, he hasn't told me this. But I know that, that it has been a stressful time these past months. It's been a blessed time, but it's also been a stressful time. And if you're not careful, you're going to have a tendency to want to let down now and, you, and relax and maybe just take a little snooze. But Jesus said, watch, watch. Don't stop living by faith. Don't let the routine fool you. In Gethsemane, the disciples thought, ah, it's just another prayer meeting. And they fell asleep. What they didn't realize, it was the finale. It was the end. Judas was approaching with soldiers accompanying him. Watch. This may be your greatest hour. Cross Point Baptist Church, this may be your greatest hour. Or it may become your greatest regret. And dear friend, tonight I... I, wanna, I, I, I thought about an incident that took place in my life when I was a very young preacher. We had started a church in a little town in Nebraska. We bought a building. We bought an existing church building owned by the Lutheran Church. It was a nice building, but it was very small. I didn't want to buy it. I thought it was too small. The men of our congregation all believed that that was the place for, for us to go and and I, I believe that God was at work in their hearts, so that's what we did. We bought that building. We bought it for $13,500. Can you believe that? A building with three lots. By the way, the church is still on that property. They, they built on the other two lots, and they built a, a beautiful, they, they remodeled and built a beautiful building, and it's still there. I could show you pictures of it on my phone if you want. <laughs> But shortly, in fact, it was actually before we had actually taken possession. I had a key to the building so I could show, show it to people. And a man dropped by to visit me who was my dad's friend. My parents and, and that man and his wife were friends, and I was friends with his kids. This man, uh, we all went to Sunday school and church together. and met Several of his kids became very wayward, and in fact, I doubt there are some of them I doubt if they've even been in church in years but this man came by and dropped by it was like four or five hundred miles from where I grew up but he was driving through on vacation he stopped at my house and knocked on my door and they came in and we visited a little bit I told him about the church I said hey would you want to see the building that we're buying and he said sure I took him down to the building I brought him in the back the door that was at the back of the auditorium and I walked down to the front, and I was talking about everything and telling about how we were going to change this and we are going to do that. I was talking about the building and all excited about it. And I paused as I got up toward the pulpit, and, and I looked back, and I saw him standing next to one of the pews, clear toward the back. He was holding on to the pew like this. And I heard him go, <laughs> And I thought, man, what's going on? Is he having a heart attack? What's going on? And I rushed back to him, and I, I put my arms around him, and I said, I, I, I called him by name, and I said, is everything okay? And he said, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I said, are you, are you hurting? He said, no, no. And I waited a moment or two, and then he said to me, I remember when the church was starting where, he was referring to the church where I grew up, 400 miles away, maybe 450 or 500 miles away. He said, I remember when the church was starting and before we built our building, he said, Pastor Goltz invited us to come and go with him in the early mornings and walk that property and pray for God's blessing upon the church. He said, I always kept thinking I'll do it. Eventually, I'll do it, but he said, I kept putting it off, and I never did do it. He said, you know, it wasn't long after that. I had the opportunity to buy a little 
camper vehicle and I decided that I needed to spend a lot of time going camping on weekends and I took my kids with me and went camping. I said little by little I drifted away from the work of God. He said to me, he called me by name. I was my his one of his sons had been my best friend at one time. He looked at me and he says, Larry is gone. He's not serving the Lord at all. And he says, it all started back there with little things. I got tired of doing God's work and I drifted away. And with great remorse, he wept and hugged me. But it was too late for him to change the direction. I am thankful that he went home. I think somehow God used that in his life and he went home and he did get reconnected. But it was too late probably for some of his children. And I'm wondering tonight, dear friends, what is the lesson of the widow's might for you? How are your motives down deep inside? Are you prepared to let God do what he wants to do in your life? I want to tell you, I've been in a lot of places. I've seen a lot of things happen. I have never, ever seen the miraculous things that have taken place in such rapid succession that I have seen at Cross Point Baptist Church. Don't miss it. Be part of it. That dear widow lady knew. She knew that those two mites might not buy much, but she knew that if she gave it to God, the Lord would honor and bless her life. You can't miss it. Don't let it happen. Make sure that you let the Lord have his way. Father, tonight, I, I watched all of those hawkers coming up and wanting to sell widow's mites. Oh, dear God, help us. Help us to see not an economic opportunity, but help us, dear Lord, to see an eternal opportunity that you are placing in our, at our disposal. And dear Father, while the pastor is gone this week, I pray that you would give him renewed vision. And God, I pray that you will under, undergird every facet of this work. I thank you, Lord, for Brother Leaf up here leading the singing tonight and for Brother Allen and for all, all of the people involved. I look around and I see so many faces of people that, that, that have been serving the Lord for a long time. Oh, Lord, help them not to let a Gethsemane happen where they fall asleep and miss the greatest opportunity of all. Help them now, Lord, to determine that they will watch and wait your coming. In Jesus' name, amen.